Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go! So this is a story from a long time back that is the biggest bit of revenge I've ever gotten. While I was in college, I had my EMT certification and decided to go for an EMT job after getting laid off from another job. It didn't pay as much, but I found a decent local job that was by my house, so I applied and got a position. I could tell it was a smaller outfit, they only had three ambulances and were desperate for any transports they could get. One day, at the end of a 10-hour shift, when I was staring at the clock ready to go home, I got a call from the owner, someone I had met only once and usually was home in Seattle. The company was in the Bay Area. He told me that he wanted me to take a call at the end of my shift and he would be putting in a bonus of $50 if I took it. I said why not and had him text us the information. Turns out he wanted us to transport a psych patient in forest trains over 600 miles. It would have easily been a 10 hour drive including LA traffic and he told us he expected us to turn around and drive back right after. I flatly refused that this would have put me at 30 hours straight behind a wheel and I was done and afraid I'd fall asleep and crash. He exploded at me and fired me on the spot over the phone after trying to convince me to quit verbally first for not doing my job. I was beyond pissed. However, he made one miscalculation in firing me. The previous job I had? Well, I was an intern at the EMS agency, specifically the one who licenses him to allow him to operate. I'd called my old supervisor, a paramedic veteran, before and after being fired with the details of what was going on. He'd said he'd take care of it, but I never got an update. Luckily for me, EMTs are in high demand, and two weeks later I had a job. I was training at a much more reputable company with over 40 ambulances and a real HR. At training, someone walked in I did not expect, a co-worker from the previous ambulance company. She told me that my old supervisor did a surprise inspection the very next day and apparently ripped the owner a new one and instantly shot him down and listed off a huge list of violations that had to be fixed. The ambulances had expired equipment slash lack in certain things. The crew quarters were not proper enough. She told me that most of the EMTs had quit and the office staff slash supervisors only stayed because he was paying them to not leave while he sorted everything. It took him nearly two months from what I heard to get everything up to snuff and get business going again. Overall, in fines and repairs plus lost staff time were easily over $250,000 along with all the lost income from not operating. Now I'm happy and just finished nursing school, so I am no longer a slave driver. So much respect for people who stay as EMTs, it's not fair, but they are paid. Back in my days working as a paramedic, I spent most time in the training school teaching clinical skills to new staff. We also had a driving section where we trained staff in response driving and also trained up new trainers. These are a couple of stories the head driving instructor had. One of the issues you find in teaching people to drive at speed is a red mist problem. Things are happening really fast and your attention narrows. This can be quite dangerous. This is something the driving instructors see when they have staff driving at high speeds and one of the consequences is that the student drivers focus closely on what they are asked to do and follow instructions literally to the letter. When training new instructors, the senior instructors apply very specific malicious compliance, or as they call it, puppet driving. The idea is a senior instructor drives and interprets the student instructor's instructions exactly. The student instructor has to think very carefully about the instructions the driver is given. One example of this is a student instructor wants the driver to accelerate. If they say, put your foot down, then a senior instructor will accelerate the vehicle as fast as they can along the road. If the student instructor then says, whoa, slow down, 
then a senior instructor will hit the brakes hard and carry out an emergency stop. Teaches you to think about what you're saying. The best story we heard of this was a chap who was really doing well in his instructor training but sometimes didn't think too carefully about what he said. The senior instructor took three trainees out to work on corners and bends. This is all about smooth transitions with careful rope positioning on entering a bend. Understanding the apex and where to accelerate on leaving the bend. A senior instructor was playing a part of a driver not getting the idea and was making jerky transitions and positioning the car badly. They were following a civilian who was taking a really nice line in the bend so the trainee instructor said, follow their line. So the senior instructor followed the instructions exactly. The driver was out in the Lincolnshire in the UK. A flat county, few hills, fast roads and some nice corners and bends. The car in front was moving quite quickly and the senior instructor was doggedly following their line through the bends. That was right up to the point where the civilian misjudged the bend that went a foot or so off onto the verge. They held the car and got back on a road. The senior instructor followed the instructions he was given exactly and followed the line onto the verge. The driving school car was bigger and heavier and so it didn't go back on a road. It went a little further off the road. The other thing about Lincolnshire is there are some really nice houses and this was the case at this bend. There was a very nice house and in front of it was an immaculate front lawn. Yard for our US friends. It could be described as bowling green, perfectly mown with those stripes you see and surrounded by a border of cottage garden plants. Into this idyllic setting came the driving school car. A ton and a half of V6 powered metal traveling at 60 miles per hour. The senior instructor braked hard, pulled the wheel round, floored the accelerator and aimed back at the road carving a pair of deep ruts in the lawn as it went. As the car got back on a road, the trainee instructor yelled stop. And sure enough, an emergency stop followed with skid marks and clouds of smoke. At this point, the senior instructor turned to the student instructor and said, Okay, how could you have worded your instructions differently? Some background first off. I am agoraphobic which is for those who don't know means that I have frequent panic and anxiety attacks. So I almost never leave home and even minor tasks can be stressful to me. Second, I live in the same apartment complex as a childhood friend who helps me out because of my condition. We will call him Greg. Since he's in charge of maintenance for this and several other apartment complexes, management knows about my condition. Third, I got a kitten a couple of months ago to keep me company and named him Hops. After Calvin and Hops. Lastly, Greg has a son who we will call Jacob. This story starts a couple of weeks after I brought Hops home. After hearing about the kitten, Jacob brought a group of kids over and they came in to play with Hops for a while while I did some cleaning. One of the kids, Caleb, kept saying how he wanted to keep Hops and even asked me if he could have him. Obviously, I said no, and thought he was joking anyway, so I thought nothing of it. The problem is that Caleb started showing up at my door every single day to see Hops and knocking on my door repeatedly about 20 times a day. Greg has made Jacob aware of my condition, so he knows that a lot of the time I just don't have the energy to deal with a bunch of kids, and he was nice enough to pull Caleb away, for which I am very grateful. One day I woke up to find my back door wide open and I immediately started to panic. Hops is obviously gone and this sends me into an anxiety attack. Eventually I calm down and hope that he will come back on his own. Meanwhile, I have been trying to figure out who came into my apartment. At this point, Greg, who knows everyone in the neighborhood since he does maintenance, points out that the couple who lives behind me has a camera hooked up to their window watching their car, which happens to be right next to my back door. He asks them if they can check the footage and after hearing the story they happily oblige to help out. I was fairly certain it was Caleb but didn't want to accuse a child with no evidence and I'm glad I didn't because it wasn't Caleb who came into my apartment. It was his mother, the Karen of our story. 
She opened my back door, walked straight in and came out moments later with my cat. The neighbors even checked the nights prior and she had been checking my door every night for several days. Probably longer but recordings were automatically deleted after several days so no saying how long she was doing this. I know a lot of people are going to tell me I should have immediately called the police but please try to understand. The situation was already very stressful for me and getting the police involved would only make it worse. Instead, Greg and I went over to Karen's apartment to confront her and get the house back. I agreed to let Greg do the talking and we knocked on the door. Karen answers the door with a, what do you want? And Greg starts talking immediately. Now Greg is very charismatic and is a no-nonsense kind of guy when things get serious. So I am paraphrasing this speech very poorly but it went something like this. Hey Karen, we know you have this poor kid's cat in there. So here is how this is going to go. You are going to give the cat back and apologize. Then you are going to have Caleb apologize for knocking on a poor kid's door all day, every day and forbid him from going over there anymore. And if you don't, we are going to get the police involved. Not just for breaking and entering, but because I know for a fact that you have drugs in this apartment. I see them every time you put in a maintenance request, which is almost every week. So let's cut the part where you deny it all and jump to the part where you tell me how this is going to play out. During his speech, Karen's face went from annoyance to indignation to worry and then to anger. By this time, Caleb is in the background and we can see him holding hops. Karen looked like she was having an intense internal battle. On one hand, she was concerned, but on the other hand, she could never possibly be in a wrong because the world revolves around her. Finally, she speaks and says, You don't have proof. I bought this cat for my son and you can't prove that I didn't. To which Greg replies, Are you absolutely sure that's how you want to do this? Karen then responds with the most snarky, entitled, Screw you, that I think any person has ever conjured in the history of mankind. She then slams the door shut in our faces. By this point, we were out of options. I agreed to call the police and report the incident. We get the recordings from the neighbors and wait for the police to arrive. The officers show up and, after hearing the story and watching the video, they immediately went over to confront Karen. Even from a distance, I could see her mouth drop into a perfect comical O shape when she saw two police officers at her door. The officers explained to her that I was not pressing charges if she just gave the cab back. As regulars of this subreddit know though, you can always rely on a Karen to dig in her heels and double down on their bad decisions. I could not hear exactly what was said but heard Karen getting louder and more enraged every time she spoke. Finally, she crossed the line and tried to shove one of the officers. Next thing we knew, she was face down on a concrete and was being told her rights. I doubt she heard any of it though, because she was screeching all the typical Karen lines like You can't do this to me, and I know such and such, I'll have you fired. It was actually a pretty pathetic display to see from a grown woman. By now Caleb was in tears still holding my cat. He walked up to one of the officers, legs shaking and handed him the cat. It almost broke my heart when he asked if they could let his mom go now. The officer was kind but explained that his mother had assaulted a cop and was likely going to jail. So I did get Hop's back but for a week felt awful about making Caleb see all that and probably scarring him for life. Fortunately there is a happy ending here. Now when Karen got arrested Greg knew I would impress charges. So she would likely only be charged for the assault which is why he decided to inform the management and they pressed charges on my behalf for breaking and entering into one of their properties as well as drug trafficking out of another property. Long story short, she's in prison. Here is the happy ending for her kid though. Apparently his dad had lost a very long custody battle a couple of years prior and this little incident naturally meant that he now had custody. Greg met him once when they came to get Caleb Sings from Karen's apartment and apparently he was a very nice man, polar opposite of Caleb's banshee of a mother. She had gained full custody of Caleb mainly by lying, but it seems that Caleb will now be raised by a competent and rational adult. 
So, this is actually a story that my mom told me from when she was in the 8th grade. Sorry for the lens. She had this art teacher, we will call her Mrs. X, who absolutely hated her. She was an older lady who was only one year left before retirement. This will be important later. My mom had BE right before her art class and she also has really bad asthma. She had left her inhaler in her locker when she was lit out late of gym. She decided to go straight to art, drop off her backpack, and then asked to go grab her inhaler from her locker. Mrs. X, having hated my mom for some time, told her to wait until announcements were over and that she could leave. She decided not to fight and to go wait for announcements. My mom's friends were ticked and they knew she had terrible asthma, so they were trying to convince her to just leave the classroom because Mrs. X didn't deserve her attention, being the witch she was. My mom said no and waited patiently until she was allowed to leave. Once the announcements were over, she went to Mrs. X asking if she could finally leave. Her response was, well, if you had enough oxygen to sit there and talk to your friends, rather than listening, then I don't think you need your inhaler. At this point, my mom is wheezing and has started to get a headache from not being able to breathe. But again, she listens to her teacher, not wanting to get further on her bad side, waits for class to end before she can grab her inhaler. Her friends continue telling her to just leave since she isn't doing any work anyway, but she tells them to just wait, knowing full well how her body reacts to asthma attacks. At the end of the class, her friends booked it with my mom's locker combination to grab her inhaler because my mom was in no shape to run. However, when they finally brought it to her, she couldn't take in enough air for the inhaler to be of any help. Her friends rushed her to the nurse's office where they told her about Mrs. X and how my mom couldn't breathe. The nurse ended up having to call an ambulance. My mom was rushed to the hospital, admitted into the ICU, almost had to get intubated then, was there for 10 days. Her parents were furious and my grandfather was ready to sue the entire state. The school, knowing that Mrs. X was only a year away from retirement, not wanting to take away the benefits she'd earned from staying, ended up striking a deal with my grandparents. My mom no longer had to take art, even though it was a required class for 8th grade. So she aided for the counselors that period. The school district was also in charge of paying for my mom's medical bills. My grandparents wanted her to lose her job, but agreed to the terms. But the story doesn't end there. My mom's brother, who was in 7th grade at the time of the incident, had to take sculpting the next year with Mrs. X for last year. A few weeks into the class, my grandparents got a letter informing them that my uncle was failing art. When confronted, he told them that on the first day of school, he had asked Mrs. X a question and she had accused him of being disrespectful. As punishment, she made him sit in a room that branched off from the main classroom. Every day afterwards, she would falsely accuse him of something and force him to sit in that room where he couldn't get any work done. Hence, why he was failing. My grandmother called up the school district in a rage, telling them that the original agreement was now off because Mrs. X was unfairly taking out her rage on my uncle and that they were ready to sue. Because the school district never thought to get my grandparents to sign a contract saying they wouldn't sue, they were forced to fire Mrs. X, much to the delight of my mother. She never got the benefits from retirement. Edit. Just to clear up some confusion since I asked my mom some clarifying questions, she didn't listen to her friends and left the classroom because she knew she was going to have an asthma attack and wanted to get Mrs. X in trouble after class. She was expecting a quick trip to the nurse's office where she could tell on the teacher, but it ended up more severe than she intended. It's one of the reasons why she'll never leave the house without an inhaler on her. She also followed up the story telling me to never do what she did because she won't be as forgiving as my grandparents were. When I turned 14 years old, I got my first summer job and had one of the best bosses I'd ever had. I recently found out that unfortunately my mentor and someone I would consider a friend, John, passed away. Although it's been well over 20 years, I still use the lessons learned and the work ethic he passed on to me. Although at times he could be hard, he was more than fair and always did the right thing for those that worked for him. 
This is a story of John versus a new president. Before I get into the story, I need to give some background and context on John. John was a textbook all-American boy. John had attended a prestigious boarding school somewhere in New England and eventually attended Yale back in the late 50s slash 60s and was not only a scholar but a three-sport athlete. He played football, he boxed and he was a captain on the track and field team. Fast forward to when this story takes place and John was still in phenomenal shape for a late 60s, early 70s man. John opted to move out to the country, start a family to follow his passion which was teaching at the local high school and coaching high schoolers in various sports. Obviously, he was a high school football coach, taught track and field and he was an outstanding shot put athlete and could run the mile and many other long distances. As a teacher, he had the summers off and became a lifeguard at the local Down Beach, eventually becoming the captain of the lifeguards. Over time, he developed standards for the town slash county slash state lifeguards to pass. He really transformed what was a ragtag style of lifeguards into a full-fledged official lifeguard core training academy and set the standards for what is still used today. John was eventually hired to run the lifeguard and manage an entire private beach club instead of working for the town beach. One of the biggest challenges of this, since it was a private beach club, John now reported into a president of the beach club who oversaw how things were run. I started working for John as a helper on a beach and then eventually a lifeguard and for the first couple of summers things were great. The president of the beach club took pride in having the best staff and making sure that lifeguards were well paid and to his credit, safety was the utmost priority. This private beach club certainly catered to the more wealthy clientele who wanted a nicer club instead of going to the public beach. Some of the advantages were the amenities which were lockers, cabanas, private parking, a very nice restaurant that served great food and drinks. This was one of the few beach clubs that also had the ability to serve alcoholic beverages. One of the good things John had instituted was that any returning member of the staff from the previous summers automatically got a raise. This ensured that staff returned the next summer avoiding a lot of retraining and as you can imagine growing pains with a new staff. What was even better was that if you returned multiple summers you still got an additional raise. Most summers, this was a dollar or two. As an example, I started at $7.25 at 14 years old. This was back in the late 90s. And by the time I was in college, I was making almost $15 an hour. Typically, the president of the club serves a term, which is a few years in. When his term was up, a new president was ushered in. Upon taking office, the new president loudly proclaimed that he wanted to ensure that the club had physical responsibility. And he would be personally going over the books with a fine tooth comb. His first order of business was to cut everyone's pay all the way back to minimum wage and fire most of the lifeguards. Now, as noted above, the staff was there for a long time, knowing most of the members and how to run the place. Prior to the start of the summer, upon learning that their hourly wage would be cut, most of the senior staff immediately left and were quickly hired elsewhere. The lifeguards were spared at the appeal of John to ensure safety. Although some senior guards left for other beaches and pools, John was able to convince the lifeguards as he would take care of things. On to the malicious compliance. While John agreed to have the staff take the pay cut, he convinced the new president that any lifeguards with additional certifications will get $2 an hour on top of the base minimum wage. The new president obviously didn't consider that any of these lifeguards would put in the effort or if it was feasible to get any certifications in time for the summer season and he agreed to the plan. As you can imagine, John basically established the process and curriculum for becoming a lifeguard and personally trained and hired most if not all the trainers in the town and county. John was also a volunteer fireman and knew all the EMS personnel and not surprisingly had either taught them in school or hired them as lifeguards in their past lives. John quickly called in favors from every trainer and certifier across the county who were more than happy to repay 
all favors John had done for them in the past. Most waived the training fees and expedited the training sessions for the lifeguards and they wanted to promote safety for the community. Prior to the start of the Memorial Day weekend, now it is effectively the unofficial start of summer, all of us lifeguards and new staff become certified in pretty much every single possible certification that existed at the time. I mean, I'm talking crazy, complete overkill and unnecessary certifications for a regular lifeguard. We got trained as either EMS and EMTs. Although lifeguards had to be certified in CPR, we retrained and got our CPR certifications again. Life-saving ocean and pool rescue techniques, certified swimming instructor, certified food inspector, the club had a kitchen, certified county pool operator license, certified sanitary inspector, cleaning the bathroom. We even had one guy who wanted to learn how to scuba. A county's firefighters had a water rescue team who coincidentally were certified scuba instructors and most of us guards become certified divers. Open water divers, deep water rescue divers, the whole works. I could go on and on about all the certifications we got. The lifeguards not only went back to their original wage, but in most cases went well above what their previous wages were. As 18 years old and back in the 90s, I personally went from making $15 an hour to $27 an hour, all due to the certifications and training. It took a month or so for the fallout to happen. While the new president tried to renege on the deal, John was smart enough to have a formal arrangement in place and there was nothing the new president could do besides whine about it. He wound up resigning his position to spend more time with his family at the beach. We rarely saw him around that summer and I think he eventually stopped coming altogether, opting to join another club. John made nice with a new president and explained his philosophy on training and keeping staff. The new president agreed and some of the senior staff wound up coming back with the promise of their original wage. A few weeks ago I heard from friends and former colleagues that just at the start of the summer season, John passed away in sleep of natural causes at the ripe age of 91. He was still working, although not as much in the past. It was more of a I want to keep busy type of thing than a need to work. Every morning he would take out the lifeguard's rowboat and get some exercise in. After all, he was a certified rowing instructor. Rest in peace, John. You were the best. This isn't my story. The revenge belongs to my friend. We will call him Alan because that's not his name. Alan is a very laid back, large ish guy who seems very gentle. But in high school, he had seething anger issues, especially with bullies, and this story was a combination of those. Alan had a math teacher, Colin Barry, because he was about that age. Barry liked to bully his students in ways that were scary but not actually violent. And being a math teacher, he was more predictable than creative. Barry owned his classroom and kept discipline by humiliating anyone who challenged him. He liked to stride along the aisles between the students' desk chairs, and he insisted on free space to stride in. When a student left belongings in the aisle, Barry would call the class's attention, wind up big, and kick the belongings extravagantly to the other end of the aisle and beyond, leaving the embarrassed student to clean up the chaos while everyone waited for the class to resume. Barry would smirk and say, Now let's not see things in the aisle again. Not that there was anywhere else to put things. One day in November, Barry kicked a young lady's entire gym bag across the classroom and her gym clothes scattered like the wind, her underwear landing on other students. She was mortified. Barry smirked and Alan seized. It had happened to Alan before. No big deal. But he was unwilling to let it go when it came to embarrassing the young lady. Alan began plotting his eventual revenge. In art class, Alan had been assigned a winter term sculpture project that could use any found material. He had decided to use nuts and bolts for December. But he listened carefully and knew that there would be a similar, higher marked project in the spring. He bided his time. Being a big guy, Alan decided his spring project would use bricks. Come January, he okayed the choice of materials with the art teacher. Then he sketched out his sculpture. 
showed where he'd obtained the materials, how and where the bricks would be used, how they would be held together, and what the final product would look like. All material was to be brought into art class and left there in the storage over the course of the term while it was being worked with. Okay, that was the art teacher too. All this took four more weeks, but that was just fine. So in February, Alan brings two dozen bricks to school, perhaps coincidentally on the day that art class immediately followed math class. And of course, what could be more convenient to carry them all in but a gym bag? There was no way for Alan to leave it in his locker between classes, since there wasn't time to get from mass to his locker then to art. So he absolutely had to bring the bag to math class. Somehow that gym bag was carelessly left projecting a foot or so into the aisle between the desk chairs. Math teacher Barry saw the bag, strode up the aisle, grinned, took a huge wind-up bend. The paramedics took Barry to the hospital, spitting and gasping with a shattered foot. Of course, Alan expected a serious investigation afterward, but he had plotted everything with so much legitimacy, so much plausible deniability that nobody could ever show deliberate intent. Most of the teachers, who knew what a jerk Barry was, suspected Alan of engineering the whole thing, but nobody could prove a thing. Alan looked contrite and kept his head down. But Barry wasn't back in math class until April. He wasn't kicking any bags from his crutches. This took place a couple of years ago, and one of my old co-workers said I should post it here. So this happened during the beginning of my senior year of high school. I was balancing out football, school, and work. I worked at a convenience store chain that's only around in my region of the country, USA. I had an incompetent store manager, she was lazy, never wanted to do work, and all the store associates, including assistant manager, were always stuck cleaning up her mess. She took two hour lunches and always thought it was appropriate to leave her shift early. For some reason, and I'll never understand why, but she did not like me for whatever reason. A good example was her rising me up for using my cell phone on a floor when it was my mother calling me asking when to pick me up didn't have my license when this was going on, or the time she gave me crap for not fully stocking the fridge. Now she came in early in the morning and I would usually come in at the end of her shift because I had school and football practice. Then there was night shift after me. She would come in the morning and see the fridge not fully stocked. This is just an example of how much of an idiot she really was and how she should be given the night shift guys write-ups for that, but no, I was her main target. Now, I had gotten very sick one weekend and had called into work so that I couldn't come in that day. None of the managers or assistant managers were in, so the team lead took my message. Looking back at it, I should blame him more than my idiot manager. I assume he never told the managers I was out because come the next week, I had a football game on Saturday, and I usually work Saturdays and when I had gotten that job earlier that year, I gave her my football schedule so she wouldn't put me on for that day. My boss calls me Friday night telling me I need to come into work on Saturday because I missed work the previous week. And no call, no show is an automatic termination. I told her I did call in, but she didn't believe me, so instead of her telling me that I was fired, I said, I quit right there on the phone. So I guess she didn't fire me, but fired me. I don't know. Now to the revenge. I already have plans to get her fired or demoted. Either one would have made me happy. Over the course of that month prior to my departure, I had taken video and pictures of how bad she had that store running. By the time I had gotten to my shift, I had taken pictures of filthy floors and bathrooms. Flies all around the food assembly area, associates on their phone, even the manager herself playing games or whatever right on the floor. Basically showing how she kept her store a rick during her shift and I was left to clean up the rest. I ended up sending this all the way up to our regional manager. She was banging our district manager. If I sent it to him, it would have gotten buried. And I got a response back that the situation would be handled accordingly. District manager ended up getting fired due to incompetence, and he was also under fire initially for sexual assault allegations from other store workers, and my store manager demoted all the way down to a basic store associate. The icing on a cake was a year later after I quit slash got fired, 
I was working at a warehouse that year after I graduated making almost $20 an hour. There was another one of the convenience stores right down the road from my building. I ended up going there for lunch only to see my old boss getting reamed out by that store manager. So it was the knowledge that I was making almost three times her hourly wage. Store associates only made $8.35 an hour and she was still incompetent at her job. It made me quite happy. Edit. Just to clarify for the knuckle draggers, I was written up for a 10 second phone call. Prior to this, I had never taken my phone out once on my shift.